I'm not going to steal their thunder. I can't really do them justice. But uh, we have William Bill Quinn. You want to come up there? And we have, I'm going to call him Moose, because I don't want to slander his name and so forth, the uh, pronunciation of it. I'll let him do that on his own. <laughs> Carmel. Carmel. And what's your last name? Menjie. Longy. Irish. Irish. <laughs> From Italy. From Italy. But these, these two gentlemen were fortunate enough to um, be picked to go through the Henry Ford School. And I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to let them do it all. All right. You want to go? Or? Okay. <laughs> now, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Sergeant Major. Sergeant. Now, you know you have to project yourself. Yeah. All right. As you know, as I have been introduced to Bill Quinn. I came to the Voice Island Boys School in 1932. Supposed to go there to learn a trade. One, I think, one month after I got there, they turned it over into an agricultural school, which was the best move they ever made. Uh, I am the only one that put in a full five years at the school. Everybody else put in four years because I came in an eighth grade and all the other of us, there was just about six of us, fell by the wayside. They didn't make it. So I put in five years. My prior history to the school in the 30s, in the, in the early 30s, 31, 29, and so forth and so on, I uh, was in different homes, bounced around, abused, uh, not in the sense that uh, we have today, but I was abused, I was, I was beat and so forth, so I wanted to, to do the work I was supposed to, lived on a farm, <coughs> so forth. It wasn't the worst existence, but it wasn't, it was a, an existence. Uh, I decided I was going to fight society. Not in those days did you fight society. <laughs> you didn't have a choice. You were an orphan, and that was it. And if you were in a state ward, you were next to nothing. And uh, that would never happen today. So fortunately, there was a social worker at the home that I was in. I was with two elderly women who could not control me. A social worker saw what was happening and where I was heading. And she got me into the Wayside in Boys School. I mm. little green yet. My first job at the school was to pick potato bugs off a potato plant. Oh. Out in the field, right opposite the Wayside Inn. Big field, right behind the barn. If you've all been down there, that, that was all potatoes. And you picked them up, put them in the can, went over and crushed them on a rock. <laughs> so, I looked up and there's Route 20 going right across there and it caused the model T's going back and forth, okay, and model A's. So consequently, I said, what am I doing here? I can leave any time I want. So I dropped my can, went out Route 20 and started walking down the road. Got as far as the end of the wayside in the road. For some reason or another, I don't know why. I wish I could give you an explanation. I turned around and went back again picked up my potato bug can, picked the potatoes and graduated four, uh, five years, uh, four years later, five years later. Okay, so that uh, is a brief history of my stay at the school, but there's, we can fill in when we have the questions of what happened there and the things that we did and the things that we didn't do, and we were good boys or bad boys or whatever it is. But that was my brief history, it's just that uh, I was an orphan and bounced around from pillar to post. And uh, the school taught us the one thing, to be a good citizen, not to be the world beater, but just to be a good citizen. I think most of us have. All right, Mook can take it from me and give you his time. Well, I've got to think for you know senior moment. Well, <laughs> let me say that in the early 30s, 31, 32, I come from Springfield, Mass. My father worked for a coal company, and my mother took care of us. And we were poor, and my mother got sick. And uh, I think it was right around May or June of 33, my father got sick. 
I went to the relatives and said, you know, there's four of us, five of us, said we can't take care of you. So I walked down to State Street in Springfield and turned us into the state. And that's how we became a state ward. The background of living in Springfield, you won't believe it. I've seen people get shot. My father got the hell beat out of him, and my uncle pulled out a 45 and said, where is he? Well, go get him now. <laughs> that was the type. Uh, we saw police chases, you name it, we saw it. We were in that environment. So then, when we got turned in, we went to Dorchester, and we ended up in North Franklin, Mass. And uh, stayed there for a couple of years, went to Milford and lived with some Italian people. Which were, all of them were good. On the farm, it was tough. We had to get up in the morning, milk cows, take care of hens, and get to school, which was four miles away. If we missed a bus, we walked. Mm -hmm. And those people, uh, they had seven of us there, plus my brother, no sister. My sister was in Milford. Just to tell you who my sister is, have you, any of you ever heard of Marie Parenti? That is my sister. She's a state representative out of Milford. But anyway, I got into this, uh, this farm in the fall of, of 37, that summer. I had to go to work. The people that I lived with got paid to take care of us a buck a day. But they said, you got to go to work. So I got a job on a dairy farm. My state visitor came and said, would you like to go to school? I said, yeah, I'll take a shot. I went over to met Mr. Young, and that fall I entered school. Now, at school, you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. You had to be dressed and ready for inspection at 6.30. Your drawers open in your bureaus to make sure everything is put away neatly. And at 7 o'clock you went to breakfast. At quarter to seven, you had assembly with Mr. Young, the headmaster. And he told the activities that were going to go on. And then a lot of us went to work. Half of us went to work. The other half went to class. Dairy barn, lumber yard, cut your own lumber. Uh, in the greenhouses, the grist mill. We had to learn how to do all them things because like, for instance, on Tuesday at the Grismo, you were the only one there. You had to start the wheel, the whole bit. And up on the table, you'll see the individual that built the Grismo. All the papers, all the da uh, data between Mr. Ford and the owner are in a museum in Philadelphia, and they won't let you take them. <laughs> because after Pepperidge Farm used the grist mill, the next guy in charge wanted to rebuild it, and he couldn't, because he couldn't get the prints, but he did the best he could. Now, during the school year, shirt and tie to go to class. No shirt, no tie, go get it. If you wanted to go uptown in the afternoon, shirt and tie, Saturday afternoon. <coughs> If you were a junior or a senior, you could go Saturday night for a couple of hours. Of course, we used to tell a group, we'll meet you in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was all part of it. Study every night at 6.30, you study. And you just didn't sit there and look at a book because the instructor was walking around. Now, in your bedroom, that had to be neat at all times. The instructors would live with us, and they walked around. We had fun with some of them. One of them is the one that nicknamed me Moose. <laughs> I was kind of a talker in class, and he was the agricultural instructor. And he said, you're nothing but a big so-and-so, and he got on, and he said, Moose. 
and that stopped. <laughs> but it also got me in trouble. I was in Hudson. After I graduated, I went to work at La Pointe machine shop. Four years of agriculture, end up in a machine shop. <laughs> but we all had jobs when we left the school. Nobody left the school without a job. And in them days, they were hard to come by. But R.J. Sennett and J.J. Prendable, who owned the company, knew each other. So four or five of us went up there for jobs, stayed there 32 years. And as you'll see, I went out and one of the lucky ones and set up the tool show in Chicago. And we had fun there. But uh, uh, classes, you, you had to study. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, the chapel was off limits, unless you were working there. This gentleman here did a, quite a bit of the building of the steeple and all the stuff up top. Me, I was just a big moose. I moved rocks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the Redstone School was an active school at that time in 37. And uh, all us guys used to fight to see who was going to go down and light that fire for Miss Tubbins. I won't go any further on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and then there was the Southwest School, which was, which was recognized by the town of Sudbury, both them schools. Uh, Miss uh, Bennett worked at that one. Now, Henry Ford himself used to come up to the inn, and when you're looking at the inn, the extreme right section was his. And we don't go near there. You weren't permitted anywhere near that, off limits. But Ford himself would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go wandering through the woods. And he'd come down by the dairy where we were working and the hen house and say, hi boys, and he kept right on going. He never bothered us. And when he came to dedicate the chapel, uh, he pulled boys out of line and talked to them. And uh, I had my picture taken with him, as you'll see up there. That's because he was dedicating the chapel. And the photographer said, ready, Mr. Ford, and I just <laughs> and had that taken. But uh, I'm trying to think of, oh, another night, uh, we had to take dancing lessons up in the big ballroom, which is now have rooms. And we're up there and we're doing the five-step shortish or whatever. Ford come up and says, stop. He says, I'll show you the way I want this done. And he took one of the girls and he gave a demo. He said, this is the way I want it done. Uh, another incident that happened, I got out of the dairy barn. And I'm over by the Redstone School, headed for Dutton House. And the limousine stopped. And he said, where are you going, son? I'm going to Dutton House. I'm going home. He says, get in. I says, Mr. Ford, I'm covered with it. I just got out of the dairy barn. Mm -hmm. He said, if you stink up the car, I'll get another one out of some of them. <laughs> but uh, he did that for a lot of us. And uh, the rules at school were very stiff. No candy, no pies, no weapons of any kind. A weapon, pack your bag, you're gone. If you were caught, now, right behind the uh, Redstone School used to be a, a pine grove, big pine tree. A guy and a girl were sitting on the edge there. They weren't doing a darn thing. Pack your bag, you're gone. They didn't want anything derogatory or whatever said about the boys at the wayside. Uh, we ran the grist mill. Uh, I got, think I got the record for running it the wrong way. So I put the water in the wheel and track it. <laughs> but, uh, oh no, uh, now that grist mill, the original wheel was wood. And it didn't work because uh, the weather would get it out of balance. That 
The one that's there now, you can put a very small amount of water and it will go. Now, have I missed anything? We grew up, we grew animals on our own. And we sold, we raised gardens and sold all the stuff to the inn. We got paid to go to school. I got 19 cents an hour when I started. And out of that, I paid my room and board. If I wanted a sweater, I had to put it on a budget and pay for it, shoes, whatever, watch. And you had to go before the headmaster and he'd say, well, you got this two weeks ago. Well, we need, to, well, that's how we got extra money. Between that, selling the groceries, the beans, everything, back to the end. But you had to work for it. Mr. Ford, believe no gimmies, you earn it. So with that, if you can think of any questions or if you have any questions, ask them. I have a couple of questions. Those stone circles you've got over there at the mill, who made, who made those? Uh, I think those were made here. But the ones that they use to grind are French imported stones because they seem to grind the flour better. And uh, that's the only answer I ever got. Uh, the other thing that Ford was going to do, he was going to use the grist mill to generate power. That was the idea of Ford's folly. He, it was a dam up across Route 20 that he built, and he was going to use it. And if you look at the main shaft in the grist mill, there was a foundation there for a generator. And he couldn't get the water rights, because down behind the inn, uh, there was a piece of land that straddled the brook that was owned by Sturdivant. And he would not let Ford cut the amount of water going by. Mm -hmm. So he, that went down the drain. When, yeah. when did that school close? 1947, I believe it was. Yes. Opened in 1928 and closed in 1947, the year that Mr. Ford died. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that answers the question of why it closed. I used to go down to Somerville to see the assembly plant when they were building Model A's. Uh, it's right off now. I, it was off the, you know, where the Shrap building is in Sullivan Square? It was up from there. And mm -hmm. I, I used to go down and see the, uh, I followed the assembly line. It was a long, low building. Yeah, I, I went down. <laughs> but at the end, <laughs> us kids used to drive the tractors without permission. <laughs> Go up in the orchard. We had an orchard of 5,000 fruit trees. You know where they were stored? Right beside the grist mill, there's a huge underground cavern. We used to make our cider there. We used to store our fruits there. Trucks used to drive in. And in the back of that place was the best glass of water you ever had in your life. What a beautiful spring. And going up to Ford's Folly across the street, there were springs all the way up. Us kids used to have a ball going up to the mountain, yeah. get some apples. Yeah. But that was all part of the stuff we had to do. No, uh, the, girls that, the girls that you danced with, where did they come from? All around, Marlboro, Sudbury. Marlboro, Sudbury yeah. I think Gloria Bonazzoli came from Sudbury. Uh, Thigh. Thigh, and there was another one. Uh, 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 Tulis, Tulis, something like that. Uh, they lived right on Route 20. And uh, Marlboro, Irene, all I remember is Irene, Connie, <laughs> they were not my girls. Uh, Ethel Smith. Now there was a girl. So I remember her. But uh, Moose, Moose, how about the stick pin story? The Saturday night with the girl. What's that? The stick pin. Didn't they used to take a stick pin or something? The girls wanted the pin. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, the girl. You know how we used to have the things under a tie. Well, the girls were collecting them. No, 
<laughs> so I had one, the girl wanted I said, you, you want this, you know, it's a payment. <laughs> so I took her out to the flower garden, down the end, was, uh, I think it was Longfellow, wasn't it, yeah. down the end down there? Yeah. I got down there, I remember the girl's name, Ellen Shanahan, <laughs> and I got down there, and there was that six foot six instructor. What are you doing here, Moose? Get back inside. <laughs> but I did get a kiss, though. <laughs> but uh, now we used to have two weeks vacation every year. The Weirs, New Hampshire. All expenses paid. And that's what we did with the spare money we earned. We went to New Hampshire. You got caught smoking, drinking, weapons. You were gone. Even up there, you had to spend a day doing kitchen duty. <laughs> and uh, punishment. Well, Mr. Young, in my book, I loved him dearly to the day he died. I had to go to the hospital and get him, bring him home. He was a super headmaster. One day, I got caught breaking into the kitchen. Three of us. We get the loot. We go to go out the door, and my buddy slams the door in my face, and I'm caught. The next morning, I went to the office, and he wanted to see who broke in the kitchen. So I says, Mr. Young, he says, Young Long, what do you want? Well, I says, you wanted to see who broke in the kitchen. Not you. I says, yes, sir. He says, you're not playing ball Friday night. I says, Mr. Young, we've got to beat this team. We've got to have the best ones there. He says, I know, but you're not playing. <laughs> <laughs> I says, OK, I won't go. Ah, you are going. You're going to sit right beside me. <laughs> and that's where I was, right beside him. But that was the type of punishment he gave out. Did you win the game? Um, huh? Did they win the game? I don't remember. <laughs> we, but, had a, uh, we had a penalty system, which was uh, very unique to this extent. Uh, uh, I was quite familiar with it because uh, I uh, got it quite a bit. And that was what you had uh, working on a weekend. Instead of going to town to be with the gals, you worked at the Dutton house, washing the floors, polishing this and polishing that. All the other guys were up town and you were working. And if your garden wasn't up to snuff, in other words, a lot of weeds, you got penalties. So guess who got penalties? <laughs> <laughs> they got the, what they call Saturdays, which meant you had to work four hours for nothing. <clears throat> yeah, because on the regular schedule, we got 19 cents an hour. Uh, 20, as you progressed up to the top, was 22. And stealing, you were, uh, oh man. You had it. Couldn't get rid of you fast enough. But uh, I'm glad I went there. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't gone there, I could honestly say to you tonight, I'd have been a bum. Absolutely. Because I can remember in Springfield running from the cops, go down along the Connecticut River. We had tunnels in the bushes. <laughs> we get in the tunnels, they couldn't catch us. But uh, it was that type of life. Um, I never knew where my mother or father was buried for 30 years. I had a lawyer on the case, and my brother Joe found it by accident. So, in fact, I'll be going there in another month. But, uh, so where were they buried? Springfield. Uh, Indian Orchard. Uh, beg pardon? Is it the one on um, Berkshire Avenue? You have to talk loud, Is please. Is it the one on Berkshire Avenue? Right I don't know. It's on the main road. Okay. All I can remember is your turn of corner. It's a Catholic cemetery? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, right I can never find it. I have to go through it until I hit the right one. I'll go with it. Okay. 
I know, I'll talk to Hazel. <laughs> but any... How many, how many boys were in your boys? Uh, there was 50 of us any time the four years I was there. 50 uh, for each year, or the 50 the whole length of time? Yeah, the 50 as a group, uh, the 8th grade, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. My class was 12, which is up there on the table. The total uh, complement from 1928, and I figured it out one day, uh, to 1947, was approximately 595. Mm -hmm. So you started figuring it out. Uh, the classes, uh, the school complement each year was never over 50 or 51, and then other times it was much less than that. Another thing in the school, if you were dissatisfied with the school for any reason, you didn't have to sit there and stew about it. You just went up to Mr. Young or the headmaster and say, I don't want we should stay any longer, Mr. Young. He'd help you pack, get you on the bus, call the social worker, they meet you, and that's it. No no fuss, no nothing. No mm. big hoorah. There weren't any shows of uh, power or anything else. It was just all done very quietly. One day you had a buddy in your room if you lived at the Dutton House or up at the Calvin House, and maybe he'd better be empty that night. You never knew mm -hmm. why, because it was none of your business. But if you didn't wish to stay, you would leave. Always let everybody left on good terms. Uh, there's a little, uh, I don't know if you call it, needle point that they do uh, on that uh, card up there that one of the men does, you know, it's in get letters on his voice at in boys' school. Uh, he was there in 1930, just one of the first few classes. Right now he's disabled, but he never graduated. But he is one of our, our greatest champions as far as the way that in boys' school is concerned. He left for the simple reason he just couldn't hack it, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the, the curriculum was concerned in school. So, but, I mean, with every reunion, a man can no longer talk, but He's at that reunion. How many other classes, uh, schools, did he have besides this one? He had uh, Macon, Georgia. He had several schools down in that area, and Dearborn, Michigan. And every year, we used to get a volume of the book. There's one up there that says The Herald. And it would be stories from all the schools. And, uh, but Ford, was very, very strong. Earn it. No gimmies. You had to work for it. That was his main thing. Now, he used to come down the inn. If you go down the inn today and you look around, you'll see this barrel. And it was Henry Ford, I think the one from New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, and uh, the big guys in the industry. And they etched their names in the bottom of the barrel. In Edward Prince of Wales. And uh, the inn itself, uh, in them days, you could go in the rooms and you could touch the material and look at it. Today you can't, because there was people going in there and they'd take a piece and put it in their pocket or whatever. Uh, the inn has changed in a lot of ways, but uh, when Mr. Popeyes took over, he was the one that had more to do to bring the Henry Ford and everything forward so that people around the country would know not only was Ford an industrialist, but he was also a man that was concerned about the people with broken homes. And that's all, all of us, none of us come in with our parents. You came in through the state. Didn't you so. travel in, in the wagon? Beg pardon? Didn't you travel in wagons? Didn't they have, I can remember being up here when, when we were a, a wagon full of young boys. Uh, yeah, he had a wagon, but I don't remember. That might have been before our time, before my time. But we had wagons, horses. We had to learn how to hook them up. We had to learn how to use them. We had to train uh, oxen. And, uh, you know, you're, you're trained oxen, you're told, don't get in front of them. <laughs> because if you do, you lose them. So you stay behind them and you hit them. You know, say, gee, ha. And he'd stay there. 
But if he got his head ahead of you, goodbye, he's gone. But we had to do everything. We built the chapel, we cut the lumber. The lumber from the chapel is the Hurricane of 38. All except the finished work. The chandelier, I think, is from uh, Czechoslovakia. And that's named after Ford's mother? Yes, yeah, it's his mother and her mother, I believe. Martha Mary Chapel. All of them like that. There's one in each place he owned. His wife was the stricter one of the two. And uh, Edsel Ford's wife was stricter than that. Uh, when Henry Ford died, this fellow that was with Ford, I think his name was Cansall, he, he was the mean one. Ford would go by and say, you need a new truck, got one. This guy would come by and say, forget it, you don't need it. Well, when Ford died, he tried to take over, but as I understand it, Edsel's wife took over. And she says, you're gone. <laughs> you're gone, out. And that's how it changed. And today, in one of the books up there, you'll see a letter from Clay Ford, the grandson thanking us for writing that book. There's a blue book up there that says, Henry Ford and his boy. Bill and I were greatly involved in the writing of that book. Why? Because I wanted, in my own way, I wanted everybody to know that to get anything in this world, you gotta work for it. You gotta earn it. It's not gonna be given to you. And we wanted to show a lot of the younger people today that the younger people in them days worked for what they got. Mm. But that was the purpose. Did you mention that you have reunions with some of the uh, graduates? We have them. Uh, this year is September right. we have 16th. It every year. We're in, uh, getting smaller and smaller. Uh, they're dwindling. As in any reunion with any organization, they dwindle. Uh, Three years ago, we had about 65, which included wives and significant others and family members. This year, last September, we had 34. We did in the fourth room. Uh, out of that 34, 12 were wayside in boys. Oh. And, all right, so you can see, uh, we, we had a lot of support from, uh, from our wives and uh, the children and so forth and so on. And another point I want to bring out as far as the chapel is concerned, uh, as I mentioned one gentleman, that steeple on the chapel was built on the ground by myself and another uh, gentleman, Carl Hay, who has since passed away. But we, uh, I learned my trade at the lumber yard or the salvage yard. Uh, I became a cabinet maker as well as a carpenter. Uh, I learned most of my work at the chapel. The uh, Cordella, or what they call the altar, I, uh, I built, then a balcony I built, and all the uh, fancy uh, plastic work on the outside underneath the cove I built. And then my masterpiece was the panel work inside. I built all the panel work on, all around on the inside, every bit of it. And then they put in a Ford furnace, and we're trying it out after the chapel was built. And they heated it up, and I forgot about it. The panel came apart and fell, as it shrunk with so much heat in it. I had to rebuild and break the paneling the second time and put it in. So that, uh, that's one little part of the story. And they, they put an end to the story. While we were building the chapel, being a, a sober kid then, I was, uh, after the, uh, uh, where the bulldozer operated there for me in it. But let me try the DC, uh, DC-6, the big bulldozer. And I, the day, they said, well, the day the chapel was finished, they let me try it. The day the chapel was finished, they went over and so can I try the bulldozer? Yep, okay, you know what to do? Oh, sure, I can drive it. <laughs> Gets into the thing, hits it, takes off, and took off the corner of the church. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing I had a good, a good boss, I mean, to strip the boards real quick and get new ones back in place and paint it within a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
do any of you remember a gentleman named Andy Apple? He came from this area. He, uh, he was a truck driver down there, and he was a great guy to work with. Any of you heard of Eddie Erkinen? Erkinen viewer down here? Well, Eddie, the father, was the, drove all the equipment down the end. Oh, he was a brother. Tractors. Huh? He was a brother to Erkin and Bjorg. A brother? Yeah. That's right. And they were brothers. The owner of Erkin and Bjorg. So, I mean, yeah. that's great. Well, we had people from all around us that worked down there. How many knew where the Babe Ruth Estate is? <laughs> How do you like them homes down there? <laughs> But you know, of all the times that Babe Ruth on that, I never saw him once. You know, we seen, uh, who was the, uh, Anita Louise, was that an actress? Yeah. 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 She was at the end. See, they have separate books when you, at that time. Uh, if you were a celebrity, you signed a special book and it was put to one side. <laughs> so any? That, that barn was across the street, is that part of the original Yes, the barn is. The other building where the <coughs> office is, that building used to be right in front of the inn. When you go in on that walk, it was right there. Henry Ford come down one day, he's walking on the street. He called uh, Ralph Sennett over and says, move it. <laughs> and that's where it ended up. At the end of that building, there was a huge tree, about this round, hollow. And that's where the people used to hide when there was Indians. They get up inside the trunk. Uh, did, did any of the boys go on? It was World War II was coming. Did any of the boys from the school go on to service? Yes. Yeah. There's a list in one of the books. Eddie Tompkins, Floyd Noyes. Um, I don't know what year you went in. Uh, I went in in '42, three. Uh, there was a whole list, Jimmy Mike, Arnold Flynn, Ernie Flynn, he got killed on Guadalcanal or Saipan. Uh, we all got into it. There was uh, quite a few. Percentage-wise, uh, I took the names of all those that I could, everyone that, that went to the Voice Indian Boys School, that had a military background, up until including Vietnam. And uh, myself, I didn't get into 44, which was the latter part of the war. And out of that uh, group, I'd say there was about a, oh, I'm trying to remember now. I, mean, I think I had about 100 and, 125 names that I was able to come up with. It was military service, the type of service, and the years and everything else. And it was, I figured, about one quarter of the uh, individuals that went to the school were in military service from World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam. Now, uh, that, that's about the only way I can answer mm -hmm. this. It. It's approximately a quarter. Uh, is there any Navy people here? Were you in the South Pacific? Well, at the last part, I spent the first two and a half years over here in the Mediterranean. Oh. Then, did you get the Mog Mog? Mog Mog. That's the beer parlor in the yeah, South Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know about that. Two cans of beer and a coke came out of the That's right. Well, Ulithi, Ulithi was a huge atoll and had other islands, and one of them was Mog Mog. And we're standing there one night, and all of a sudden, we hear ding, 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 general quarters, general quarters. The Japs blew up the beer power. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, all I can say is I've been lucky. I've had a very enjoyable wife and life. I have a wonderful family that is scattered. St. Louis, Maine, Maryland, but all due to the upbringing by Mr. Ford. He's the one that taught us how to, how to be American citizens. So I own that. Any other questions? Yeah.
as an as a <clears throat> agricultural school, how did you pass the winters? In other words, what did you do during, during, during the winter months? Oh, what did we do? Yeah. Plow snow. <laughs> yeah. No, during the winter, well, we had the two houses, Calvin, Dutton. You had to clear that snow, parking lot. We had the inn we had to do. You did it with the horse and the V-plow. Remember that V-plow? That's how you did it. Didn't have nothing mechanical. Eddie Erkman was the first one to drive mechanical, uh, what do you call them, diesel, uh, Things there, not down trees, whatever. DC six, yeah. Yeah, we had that to do, and uh, I can't think of much else except move snow. You had to walk the class most of the time, but uh, you were kept busy. You had things that had to be done. Did you still have the cattle bombs at that time that you had to take care of? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Had dairy. We dairy. had uh, an upper and lower dairy. We had a hen house with a thousand hens. Uh, we had the horses to take care of, and uh, we had to separate the milk. Of course, we had a cup of cream while we were there. <laughs> but we had to do all that, cutting trees down, preparing them for the lumber, everything. No matter what it was, us kids learned how to do it. Were you still cutting ice, ice at that time? Huh? Were you still cutting ice at that time? Yes, we, the pond right behind the inn. Uh, what the heck is the name of the pond? Um, oh, you mean, uh, oh, there's a name for it. But we had a horse and we cut it up the ice and the ice house was right there. We built it and it was covered with sawdust mm -hmm. and uh, preserved the ice till the spring or whatever, when I needed it. Cooking, we had to learn how to cook. I cooked a roast once, better to the instructors, was raw, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you one, one other little quality. We had pancakes. Every Tuesday we had pancakes. And they were real sinkers. <laughs> <laughs> and Kabui, Eddie Tompkins, myself, and Jimmy Pullis ate 133 of them. <laughs> Eddie was one of the guys that was making them. See, we had to go in and make them ourselves. And so we had some extras. What the heck am I gonna do with these? So he opened up the back door and he made a mat, the pancakes, and a cook them in. Did you guys say more? <laughs> he was in deep trouble. <laughs> but, uh, Oh no, we had a lot of fun. It was one, fun. One fun. other thing we had to do, we took care of our own laundry. That's right. I, I had our own shirt and they had to be starched. Starch collar, starch front, and starch cuffs. And they had to be right. Because you would check before you went down to dancing class with your starch shirt on. Oh yeah. <laughs> and you learned how to do it. Matter of fact, at the time, a uh, number of years ago, it used to be uh, oriental uh, establishments that uh, did laundry, you know, and shirts and so forth and so on. We were all, almost equal to that, not quite. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was true. You had to do that pressure on suit. In fact, I used to make money on the side doing Arnold Rogin's suits. He was 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> had a rag, you know, towel and steam. Yeah. Made a couple of bucks. So when we went to the beach or whatever, we had money. Oh yeah, but of all the times you're not supposed to be smoking, we're up in the Weirs, New Hampshire. We're not supposed to be out at 10 o'clock at night, but somehow some sheets hung down outside the window. And we'd sneak out, and sure in hell, there was three instructors. <laughs> They didn't see us. Oh. Uh, How old were you when you went there? Well, I was born in 22, and that was 37, 15, 16, in that area. And that was the average age? Um, the yeah, around that, 15 to 19 in there. And uh, we all got, some of us fought, but we all got along. So you had to. 
I saw your report card uh, in the back. What, what, what kind of courses did they teach there? I mean, everything. You name it, they taught it. Yeah. At different, uh, I think it was freshman, sophomore year, you had more like if you were in a regular high school. Then you got into the agricultural part of it. But it didn't do much good because I ended up 32 years in the machine shop. <laughs> <laughs> you have a favorite instructor? Huh? Did you have a favorite instructor? Or? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, the one nearest and dearest was William F. Young. He was the headmaster. Arnold Roji, 6'6", six, six, out of uh, Cape. What's the city down there? The main one. Hyannis. Hyannis, yeah. And he lived not too far from the Kennedys. Yeah. He was on Riverview Street, and his wife was the one that took care of old JFK, the old man. Oh. So I had to drive him over, drive her over, and we got stopped by the police, and he looked in, oh, hi, Mary. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I drove in the driveway. I almost knocked Peter Lawford over with the <laughs> And I went to go around the bush, and there was the old lady's car. I almost hit it. She parked it right in the roadway. But she was uh, pretty tough. But Arnold Rogin, had, I think he had six kids, and one of them used to drive the boat over to uh, uh, Nantucket. We all got a free ride. <laughs> and his brother-in-law had ten. When I tell you that round table was like that, <laughs> and they'd say, dinner! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Out! Ten kids. They didn't care which ones there were. There were sixteen of them. <laughs> ten got in. But uh, all this was due to going to school, which I enjoy it. Probably not at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but is there any other question? What year were you at the point? 1941 to 75, I think it was, or 74 in there someplace. I was there at 41, I think. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> We used to have a German guy. You knew Schneider? Schneider! <laughs> this guy, he, was, he wasn't a dummy. <laughs> He'd say, Moose, let me do the dinky. <laughs> and, uh, what he kind of heck happened one night with him? No. Oh, there was a, the old man was still alive. And he had a friend that was pretty old, so he had to put him busy. So he put him in the backyard at the gate. And Schneider come along and he wanted to get out. He couldn't get out, the guy wouldn't let him out. <laughs> Next day, the guy did his washing. His old moutons, you know, the underwear, and he hung them on the fence. Schneider went up with a pair of scissors and cut all <laughs> But to tell you another little incident, I was working for Bob, for Snyder. I was repairing a spiral grinder, and I'm looking underneath at the bronze nut. I had to replace it. Now I'm looking, and he hits me right here. Yeah, Moose, what are you doing? I said, I imitate him. I said, Wabbit, I'm dinking. <laughs> and he says, Moose, you let me do the dinking. You <laughs> the work. And off he went to buckets. <laughs> he comes back and he says, Moose, there's a light bulb in your head and it's out. <laughs> but, but he was a good guy to work with. Uh, I did work for him when I was trying to raise a family and money was short. Bob would say, come on up the house, you're gonna have your paper. I'm papering the bathroom and I had to go up like this. I hear crash. He fell asleep, he's in the tub. <laughs> he was a great one for doing that. But I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking about it.